Hello and welcome. This is part three of rotational motion videos. Uh, so we covered uh, the kinematics of rotational motion. We saw what uh, form the kinetic energy had in the case of rotation. Uh, let's repeat that. The kinetic energy for rotation is now given as one half I omega squared, where I is called the moment of inertia, which is basically a sum. Uh, it could be a discrete mass distribution or a continuous uniform uh, or non-uniform mass distribution, where Mi is each mass and Ri is the, um, the distance from uh, uh, some axis of rotation, all right? So if the object is made of, uh, let's say, n particles, the moment of inertia is this sum here. Moment of inertia. So uh, using the uh, kinematics uh, variables, uh, theta, the angular position, or delta theta, angular displacement, uh, angular velocity, omega, and angular acceleration. Uh, we know how to do kinematics in the case of rotational motion. Now today I'm gonna to talk about the dynamics part of it. Okay, so what happens if we involve uh, things like mass? Um, well, we already have mass in the moment of inertia, but in the case of uh, when you apply a force, how does the body react to that force? And uh, a composite material, a rigid body made of little particles. Think of a structure made of little uh, Lego, Lego particles, uh, Lego pieces. Uh, so each Lego piece will have a mass, Mi, right? And then the, the thing that you make with the Legos will have a total mass. So how do they relate? Uh, in the case of uh, rotation, all right? So that's the dynamics part I'm gonna uh, be talking about today. All right, so let's start with the notion of uh, torque. Torque has to do with uh, force, but not just uh, the magnitude of it. Now it matters um, uh, the direction of this force. Now force is a vector and uh, when I covered vectors in class I said you can take a vector and you can move it as long as you don't change the direction and the length of the vector remains the same it is the same vector okay you parallel transport this as long as uh, the space you're transporting it in is flat you know unlike uh, a sphere uh, or any curved surface, if the surface is flat, you move it around and then you get the same vector. So force is a vector and until now we did not really care where we applied the force because we could always move the vectors in a parallel fashion, fashion and then it wouldn't have really that much effect on our uh, calculations when we had point particles. But now it does matter where we apply the force, right? When you're opening a door are you using the doorknob or are you using, are you applying the force to a point on the door where let's say you're closer to the, uh, let's say this is the X, Y, Z axis, axes, and then you have this door here, which is free to revolve around the uh, Z axis. Here's a doorknob, okay, are you applying the force here or over there? Okay, the result will be different. Uh, so now it matters where you exert the force, all right? So we gotta be really careful where the force vector is in our uh, coordinate system, okay? When we deal with rigid bodies and rotations. So, that's why we need the notion of the torque. So let's say we have such a force, and then we wanna 
uh, model this as, you know, we have a fixed point in space where the axis of rotation is. So we want to find the effect of this force on an object which is rotating about that axis. All right. So looking from above, for instance, if I look at the door example here, let's say you're looking at this problem from a top view, right? So you have your X axis and then you have Y axis and the door is looking from above, looks like this, right? The door is rotating this way about the hinge here, the hinge. In general, these are called the pivot points, right? The pivot. So in that picture, Z axis is coming towards you, coming out of the page, all right? So um, the door rotates like this. If you remember the right hand roll, uh, you wrap your fingers in the direction of rotation. And then the uh, thumb tells you which way uh, omega is pointing at. Omega is a vector, remember, angular velocity. So in this case, you would have the, according to the right hand rule, if you do that, uh, omega vector is pointing in the negative z direction. Okay, I'm going to use this symbol here, a cross in a circle. That means negative z direction. Or in the 3D picture, I can show it this way. That's your omega. Anyways, it's just to refresh your memory from previous uh, videos, how to determine the direction of omega. But looking from above, all we see the xy plane, and we see a dot, which is the pivot point, right? That's the origin in our case. So we need a point. So I'm going to take a force in space, and I'm going to consider a point in space, P, pivot point. Okay. Now I'm going to define torque based on this. The first thing I'm going to find out is this line here. It's also called line of action. line of action or force line, call it anything you like, force line, line of force, okay, line of action. It's just the line that represents the direction of the force, okay. Now, point P is here. Find the shortest distance between that line and that pivot point, okay, the shortest distance from the pivot point to the line will be a projection which will be at 90 degrees. So right there. This line is the shortest line that connects the line to the pivot point, okay? This shortest line is called a lever arm. lever arm or sometimes arm length or just arm. Let's call it uh, R or L. Let's call it L, lever. L stands for lever, okay? The lever arm is the shortest distance between that pivot point and the line of action. All right, now th this definition of torque is a little bit uh, theoretical or abstract, but it'll make sense. Okay, just bear with me. So if I have F and L, okay, I'm gonna consider the magnitude of F, which is just the length of the arrow, right? The length of the arrow, the magnitude. Take this magnitude and multiply it by L. This is our torque. The letter, the Greek letter tau, is to represent torque. Okay, a new physical quantity having the dimensions of uh, force times distance. Okay, let's look at the uh, unit now of this quantity force in newtons, length in uh, meters in SI unit system. So the units will be 
Newton meters. All right, if you want to find out the dimensions of it, remember one Newton is, uh, remember it's from uh, F equals MA, right? Uh, so one Newton is one kilogram meters per second square. All right, we're just multiplying it by um, another meter. So we have kilogram, kilograms, meters squared per second squared, or in terms of uh, dimensions, kilogram is the unit or dimension of mass. And then we have length squared divided by time squared. Okay, Newton meters. Now this may look actually familiar uh, when we did the work and energy. Remember, you push an object a distance and the force you apply is F, you push it for a distance, a displacement of delta X. So you again multiply force by distance and then we called it the one joule, right? That's the energy, a different context though, all right? So that was, uh, in the context of energy. Force times distance gave you work, which has energy units. So one joule was indeed one Newton meters. In this context though, uh, rotations, rotational dynamics, um, it's called a Newton meter, the unit for torque, all right? Okay, so don't use joules here, all right? So this is the basic definition of torque, okay? All you need is a force and a point in space. What you do is you determine the line of action, which is simply the line that the force represents, and then find the shortest distance between that line and the, um, that line and the pivot point, okay? Point P. For instance, some other distance here, let's say if you consider this line here, which is not cutting the line of action at 90 degrees, that's not the shortest distance, okay? We don't use that or this one here. Just find the shortest distance when you have 90 degrees. Now that's the most elementary definition, all right? Uh, but if you think about real life examples, okay, you may have situations like going back to the door, okay? When you push the door, you use the handle, and you may say, okay, the force you exert is uh, perpendicular to the door, all right? So if the pivot point is right there, and then you push the door from the handle, yes, indeed, you have a uh, line here, which is at 90 degrees. This is the line of force. And yeah, why not, okay? It makes perfect sense. But what if uh, you tie a string to the doorknob, and then you pull the string from far, okay? And then there's no guarantee that uh, the force will be at a 90 degree angle. So let me try to illustrate that here. Let's say you have uh, an object, a wooden plank, okay? And then you pivot it from here. Let's say you, you it's horizontal, maybe you have a uh, you have an object right under it, okay, like a seesaw, but the fulcrum, that's what it's called, fulcrum, is uh, to the side like this, and you're exerting a force in this direction, let's say. This is your force, okay? It's supposed to be at the edge like this. Now the length of the plank is let's say capital L, right? But the angle between the force and the plank is not 90 degrees anymore. It's some arbitrary angle, theta. So what is the torque in this case, okay? Our basic definition here for torque, assume that we had this uh, lever arm, which represents the shortest distance between the force line and the pivot point. 
Now that line, I'm sorry, that uh, arm length or lever arm is not capital L in this picture. It's okay, I can find it, right? Just find the uh, line of action, this line here. This is the line of action. And then the shortest distance, okay, and that's easy. Just draw a line which will cut the first line and a 90 degree angle, all right? So this is your lever arm. We called it little L, right? Little L, lever arm. But what is it? Capital L is the hypotenuse, right? And side opposite over hypotenuse. So L over capital L is sine theta. Therefore, L is capital L sine theta. And then the torque tau will be equal to this force, its magnitude times L times sine theta. Okay. So, um, if you wish, you could uh, picture this a different way. I'm going to just redraw it here, the wood plank. Here's the fulcrum, that base, and here's my force. At an angle, F. Force F at an angle, theta. Now, like uh, any vector, F can be decomposed into its uh, components, okay? Like X, Y components. In this case, X could be a line which is parallel to the plank and Y is perpendicular to that. So we have the uh, component. Just box, draw a box around it. Like this, a rectangular shape and identify the sides as the components. So this will be the perpendicular component. Let's call it F inverse T, means perpendicular, right? And then the other component is the side adjacent to theta, right here. This is the other component. Okay, it's a parallel. It's supposed to be parallel to the uh, plank. F parallel. All right, two components. Now, if you think about it, uh, you could just simply get rid of the original vector, uh, the red, the one in red, and replace it with these two vectors, which are perpendicular to each other, and the effect will be the same. The net result is the same. It's no difference because you can add vectors, right? So imagine that you get rid of the red force and replace it with two forces. All right. So one of these forces will have absolutely no uh, effect on rotation. Which one do you think that is? Is it perpendicular one or is it the parallel one? If you're trying to open a door, okay? Open a door, but you exert the force parallel. Can you open or close the door? No, it's the other one that does the job, right? So the parallel component of this force <coughs> will absolutely have no effect on the rotation here. So it will be the perpendicular component. It's already perpendicular. Therefore, the length of the plank becomes the arm, the lever arm, automatically. So the length of the plank, L becomes the, uh, the arm, lever arm. So what do we do here now? We just multiply F perpendicular by, let me use red here, multiply F. Okay, let me zoom out a little bit so I have room. Okay, and move it a little bit up. All right, so F perpendicular 
times L, which becomes the lever arm, is torque now. But L, I'm sorry, F perpendicular here is nothing but F times sine theta. Therefore, torque is equal to F sine theta times lever arm, which is exactly what we found earlier. Okay, this is the torque with respect to, or the torque due to the perpendicular. What about the parallel? Zero, right? It doesn't produce any rotation. So we're gonna call it zero. I mean, it's not really definition. We're gonna come to the relatively general uh, definition after this. Just think of uh, its contribution to the rotation. The parallel component will not rotate it, okay? Therefore, I'm gonna call it a zero torque. And if I add these two, I still get uh, F sine theta times L, or FL sine theta, right? It's either this part here, F sine theta times L. Bottom line, same result. Okay, Depend, no matter how you look at it, either look at the original uh, definition we used and simply calculate the uh, lever arm, which is here, L, lever arm, and multiply it by uh, your original force, or think about the components of the force along the object, which is the plank, parallel component, or uh, radial, because if it rotates, you know, you can think of a circle around that uh, pivot point. That's why it's a radial component or parallel component, which doesn't contribute at all, but the perpendicular component does the job, okay? So no matter how you look at it, you get the same result, F sine theta L. All right, so using this idea then, we can come up with you know, uh, a definition which uh, works for all cases, in all situations, a mathematical uh, formula, I think called the most generic formula for torque. Write torque as a vector. Now, here's how you do it. Uh, again, you have this force given to you. But now you're observing this from a point. Let's say this is the axis x, y, z. And you want to calculate the uh, effect of this force in terms of rotation. And you're watching it from a point. And that point is this, the origin. Okay, so the force is applied on the object at this point here. It doesn't matter what object, what shape the object has right now, okay? We're not interested in that. I mean, it could be the door in the previous example or some arbitrary object, okay? It doesn't matter. But let's say it's pinned here at the pivot point and, you know, maybe there's another hinge here, okay? Or it's not pinned at all. It could be in outer space an asteroid, okay? And then another asteroid comes and hits it, okay? As it hits it, the first one will rotate, okay? So you can think of the most generic case. Doesn't matter how you look at it, but you, I'm gonna pick an origin. It's just my origin, okay? The pick, the point that I pick. And um, for the asteroid problem, this could be the center of mass. Works perfectly, okay? Because objects tend to rotate around the center of mass. There's center of mass in free space, okay? So let this be the center of mass, no problem. Just draw the uh, position vector from this origin, R, all right? And then calculate the uh, vector product, the cross product, R cross, F, all right, 
I hope you remember uh, cross product. Okay, let's uh, quickly review that. Um, R is our position vector, right? X times I hat plus Y times J hat and Z K hat. I hat, J hat and K hat are the unit vectors. Unit vectors by definition have magnitude equal to one. All right, so you can write a uh, force the same way. This will be the component, of course, X component plus Y component times J hat plus the Z component K hat. All right, so I, J and K lie along uh, these X, Y, Z axes. This is I hat. This is J hat. And here you have K hat, okay? So three vectors are perpendicular to each other. So if you recall from a uh, vector product, uh, from vectors, when you take the cross product of two vectors, you obtain another vector unlike the scalar product or dot product where you multiply two vectors and obtain a number from them. In this case, you obtain another, another vector. I cross J gives you K, okay? You can use the right hand rule. So I, J, and K. I cross J gives you K. I cross, I'm sorry, J, uh, J cross K, gives you I. J cross K gives you I. It's a cyclic relationship between these three directions, I, J, and K. So if you go in this direction, okay, I cross J is K. J cross K or K cross I gives you J, etc. But if you go in the other direction, they're negative. For instance, J cross I would give you negative K, okay? So using these basic rules, and if you also keep in mind that when you take the uh, cross product of two parallel vectors, like I cross I, you get zero, all right? If you apply these rules to, uh, to our product here, for instance, uh, the Z component of torque will involve uh, the X component of R, which is X, and the Y component of F, F, Y, and then you do it the other way around and then you'll have a negative sign because of the um, J cross I term, right? You will have a minus Y cross, I'm sorry, minus Y times FX. And you can repeat this for uh, tau X and tau Y as well. Just an example, okay? Example. Um, you can also write the magnitude of the dot product, which, is, which will be actually my point here. So if you consider the magnitude of tau, the magnitude of this cross product, that's equal to the magnitude of x times magnitude of f times the sine of the angle between them. Where is an angle? Just uh, this one here, okay? The angle between the two vectors which you are cross multiplying, all right? So that makes perfect sense with the unit vectors, right? I and J are perpendicular, for instance. I and J are perpendicular, therefore you have sine 90, which is just one, so 
one times one is one. But if you consider I, you know, and then a vector which is uh, four times I, these two are parallel, okay? So it is sine zero. Sine, sine zero, which is zero. That's why we have I cross I zero, but I cross J equal to K, all right? Or um, J cross K, same thing, equal to I. Okay, but here's what I wanted to show you. That's the most important thing here now. This part here. Oops. Uh, this from the previous slide. That's that's our uh, uh, talk, right? So, in the case of the uh, seesaw. Okay. Now let's put the uh, fulcrum at the left end again. All right, so if I take uh, this point to be my origin, I'm talking about a position vector R, like this, and a force vector, which was like this, right? F. Now, you gotta be careful though, in this picture, theta, is this angle here, all right? Now, that's theta, the angle between the two vectors, all right? But the other angle here, now let's call this phi. This is what we called theta in the previous slide, but now I'm calling phi and r had a magnitude equal to, well, I think we named it L, right? We called it capital L. So torque was, in the previous slide, uh, F L sine phi, all right? Now we are claiming it's equal to L, which is uh, the magnitude of R, times F times sine theta. So sine phi has to be equal to sine theta, which is the case because they add up to 180, all right? If you remember from the unit circle, uh, okay. So the unit circle, one, one, and you have some angle here. That's, uh, that is um, what we call theta, let's say, theta. All right, the sine of this angle is nothing but this side here along the vertical axis, okay? And oh, that's also the sine of uh, this angle here. So, they share the same uh, sign, okay? So these uh, definitions are all consistent. Mathematically, this is enough, okay? R cross F to represent torque. For application specific cases, you can use those practical uh, tools. Either go with uh, the very basic definition of, hey, find the line of action, and the shortest distance between that line and the pivot point, that's called lever arm. Lever arm times force is torque, or uh, dissect the force into its perpendicular and parallel components, and get rid of the parallel or radial component, use the perpendicular. Just multiply the perpendicular component by the radius of rotation, and you get the torque, okay? So I'm giving you uh, three different ways of looking at the same thing. They are not really that different, okay? They're all the same. 
All right, so why do we need torque? Okay, we need it to do dynamics, which means uh, linear dynamics, F equals MA. Can we apply F equals MA for objects which are rotating? Not like that, we have to uh, change it, okay? We have to adapt it to rotational case, rotational motion. So let's start with uh, remembering F equals MA, all right? How, how we used it in problems. Now, the difference will be, of course, we're not using uh, point particles anymore. But just so you remember uh, some basic ideas, like uh, probably you'll remember this from class where uh, three boxes uh, were lying on the floor and you're lazy, instead of carrying them uh, uh, one by one, you wanna maybe uh, move them all at once. Okay. Interesting. Okay, and then let's see, there's another one here. I mean, these touch each other, okay? All right, and then don't worry about the vertical alignment here, just a picture. But if you remember, uh, you would push from the left, the three boxes laying on the floor, right? You push with your external force here. These are not glued to each other, they're just sitting next to each other, but you push them and uh, ignore friction for now. Let's say no friction. You would expect all three move together with some acceleration, uh, with some acceleration A. So these were, let's say, M1, M2, M3. So the total mass is M1 plus M2 plus M3. Okay. Um, you can view it like a system. So this system will have an acceleration A and total mass times A would give you the external force. This you remember, I hope, right? But if you analyze this uh, with individual, what happens to, considering what happens to the individual objects like uh, M1, yes, it is pushed from left with ex external, but M2 exerts a force on it as well. Right, let's call it F on object one by object two, F12. Similarly, uh, M2 will push M3 to the right this way. I'm gonna call it F32. Object three pushed by object two. So using the same idea, I could uh, add an arrow here. This is now a force on object two because of one. Similarly, I have here, okay, F two, three, right? So if you analyze the forces on each uh, object like this, let's take a look at the net force then. Okay, the net force. So I'm gonna call this F1 net, all right? Now F1 net is the net force on M1, which means F external plus F one, two, okay? I mean, that's okay if I write them as vectors with the arrows on top, but uh, if you wanna do it uh, in terms of uh, magnitudes and pick this direction as positive, x direction, so right is positive, left is negative, then if you just think about 
finding the uh, net force in magnitude, you take uh, the magnitude of F12 and subtract it from the magnitude of the external force. Right, that's how you find the net force on one. Similarly, you could find the net force on two. F2 net would be equal to, okay, so F21 is pushing it to the right, and F3, F23 to the left. Similarly, the net force on the third object will be equal to uh, just F32. And now remember uh, Newton's third law. Newton's third law, action reaction pair, right? If you have two objects in contact, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. So if you consider the contact between M1 and M2, the two forces F12 are uh, equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. So you can write them like this, or in terms of magnitude only, F12 would be equal to F21, okay, where F12 means, oops, where this means the magnitude. Okay, so, the magnitudes are the same, which means if I add these three forces, if I add them, F1 net plus F2 net plus F3 net. Okay, so these will cancel. F12 and F21 because of this reason, all right? You add them, and then you get rid of them. Similarly, F23 takes care of F32, this is negative F23, negative F23 plus F32, zero. So what is left? This guy. F external, all right? So the sum of the net forces on each object will be equal to the sum of the masses, M2 plus M3 times the acceleration they share, which is A, okay? All objects move with the same acceleration. I observe it, I look at the object, this of this three objects, the system of three objects, they accelerate with the same A value, so, that's why I consider it like a system. That's the total mass. So the right-hand side represents the system of such a mass with accelerating. On the left-hand side though, I have the external force, which happens to be nothing but the sum of individual uh, net forces, okay? The, the net force on each object. Now, why did I go through this again? Just to explain rotation, okay? so. In the case of rotation of rigid bodies. Now, first, I'm going to consider the rigid body as a collection of little particles or lined up like this. Okay? It doesn't really matter at this time that they are really glued or have a tight bond, you know. Or, which is a condition for being a rigid body. But for what I'm gonna tell you, we don't even need that right now. Just think about the Lego pieces, okay? A chunk of 1,000 Lego pieces, and they're all, uh, let's say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna draw here a thousand pieces, but let's say here, 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 it's like a brick wall, but think in 3D, all right? What I want you to do is though to concentrate on one of them only. Okay, let's say this guy here. This is the 
this is somewhere in the middle, all right. This Lego piece has a mass MI, all right. And it's surrounded by many other pieces. All right, so it's kind of like M2 in the previous example. In the previous example though, we had only two forces acting on it, uh, ignoring its own weight and the normal force. I'm just talking about horizontal. But in this case, okay, this is a Lego piece. Let's say you make, you build an asteroid, some space rock, okay, model. And then uh, this space rock is in outer space. Forget about gravity and normal force. Forget about all of those. Suppose this um, MI is actually where the center of mass is also. All right, so I'm gonna label it also as the center of mass. Center of mass. And suppose you start pushing this object. You exert a force along that line here. Okay, F. So what do you expect? Well, I don't expect this to do anything but accelerate in the direction of the force, okay? I'm not expecting it to rotate. Remember, it's in outer space, okay? So don't think about gravity and then all I expect is this to accelerate in that direction where I apply the force because the force goes to the center of mass, okay? If this doesn't, if it's not clear now, it'll make sense in a little bit, okay? But this will be the direction of the acceleration, all right? So, I see that this Lego piece in the middle is accelerating. So, if I multiply its mass by that acceleration, that should give me the net force on that Lego piece, right? So I'm gonna call it Fi net. So I is an index here that goes from one to 1,000, okay? There are 1,000 Lego pieces in there, okay? And I'm just looking at the one in the middle which is the center of mass, 565, okay? So that's what I is. But it has a mass, Mi, and just like all of the other Lego pieces around it, it's accelerating in that direction. Therefore, that acceleration times its mass is equal to the net force on that Lego piece, all right? Okay, so it's just like the previous case, only there are 1,000 pieces, pretty much. That's what um, I'm doing here. But keep in mind uh, that Lego piece is surrounded by other pieces as well. So if I draw the forces that other pieces exert on our guy here, for instance, my here, they're all around, all right? I mean, think in 3D. It's surrounded by other particles. So I'm going to call these uh, the forces. Uh, let's name them, let's say, this is acting on the i-th particle. Uh, so one of the neighbors, let's call it one. So fi1 uh, is this one. And next we have fi2. Here fi three, okay? If there are 10 other Lego pieces touching it, there is there are 10 forces, Fi1 through Fi10, okay? But if you add them up, so Fi1 plus Fi2 plus, of course, we're talking about the vector sum here all the way to the last one, Fi10. Okay, I'm gonna put a comma between I and the number here. All right. If you add them up, just like you were doing it previously, you get Fi net. All 
All right, so what happens then? Uh, if I repeat this for every little Lego piece, 1,000 of them, meaning uh, at the, find the net force on each particle, and then add these up. If I add them up, all I get is the external force right here. The external force, nothing else, because all of the forces, the contact forces between the Lego pieces, they, they will add up to zero, okay? Just like it did in the previous case. If I add those uh, individual net forces, I will get the external force, okay? So if you add all of these, I'm gonna use the symbol here, sigma, which stands for summation, right? I will get uh, F external. Okay, still no rotation, all right? But now we're gonna do something different. What if I exert this force, not here, but here? What happens then, okay? I think you guessed it right, it's gonna rotate. So you would expect the rotation All right, so the center of mass is here, the center. If I'm exerting a force like this, I don't expect it to rotate, but if I do this, exert a force, it'll rotate it, okay? That's something we can observe. So let's do that, okay? I'm gonna open up a new whiteboard here. All right, so here's our object. Again, many, many Lego pieces. And um, the center of mass was here. Let's label it center of mass. But now the force I'm exerting, the external force, which could be another asteroid hitting it in outer space, okay? Asteroid collisions, or anything you can imagine. This external force here, F external. That doesn't go through the center of mass. The line of action is right there, okay? So what happens? We expect this to rotate. That's an observational fact, okay? Happens all the time when you open a door, for instance. So, obviously we're talking about a torque here, okay? A torque. Um, so let's do this. Let's consider again an ith particle, which is uh, a Lego piece right there. Right here. MI, okay? So, this will rotate, okay? Now, don't worry about what happens to the external force when the rotation is going, you know. Don't think in terms of, hey, one full rotation, does the force rotate with it or the force keeps, don't worry about that. Think about the instantaneous uh, movement at that instant, okay? Think about what happens at that instant. So you don't even have to complete a circle, which would be like this. Let me draw a circle here. Right? Okay, my circle is a little bit uh, off-centered here. So the center of mass is more like this now. Huh? Here's the center of mass. Okay, so let me erase the other one here. Okay, doesn't matter. But what, what you expect is a motion in a circle, at least at that instant, right? So if you think about the radius, 
radius r or let's call it ri because it's only for this object here this particle this lego piece which has <coughs> a mass mi so at that instant what do we have we have angular velocity right let's mark the angular velocity there let's use the green the angular velocity I'm sorry, linear velocity is this way, V. Of course, the angular velocity using the right-hand rule is coming towards you. It's coming out of the page. I'm not going to draw that. Okay. So or let's just put omega here. Uh, but the actual direction of omega is coming out of the page, which you can show by a dot in a circle okay using the right hand rule thumb tells you which direction omega points at but this is the linear or tangential uh, velocity which is simply along the tangent line the tangent line here which is at 90 degrees but because of this force uh, it's not only going to rotate but speed up okay so that will be giving us and uh, angular acceleration as well. So angular acceleration alpha. Okay. Now if it is speeding up, it's parallel to omega. It's slowing down. You know, it's anti-parallel. Right now, in this for this example at least for this model, it is parallel. Okay, fine. Let's make it a dot in a circle again. But oops. What what I really care is the tangential acceleration which is also a long v a t okay a t is a tangential acceleration tangential acceleration of the ith lego piece mi okay don't forget we're only looking at this piece here of mass mi. All right, okay, so at that instant, uh, we have the tangential acceleration. But we know it's gonna rotate, that's what we see, all right? So we know how to relate the rotational variables to their uh, linear counterparts. So in this case, a t would be simply equal to r i times what alpha now remember there is only one alpha for the whole object okay for no matter where you are on the object here m i plus one okay that is r i one r i one plus r i plus one away from center of mass Different mass, different radius, but the same omega and same alpha. That's what it makes a rigid body after all, okay? So there's only one alpha. That's why I'm not putting any index on alpha, okay? There's only one alpha. So, but I need, still need to put an index on uh, A here. Let's call it ATI. So, uh, A, T, I plus one, the next guy. It doesn't have to be right next to it, okay? It doesn't matter how we number them. The point is though, uh, it'll have a different radius, but same alpha, okay? Same angular acceleration for rigid body. Now, let's go back to the ith particle, Mi. Mi has this acceleration equal to Ri times alpha. Now, Mi at that instant is accelerating in a direction with this magnitude At. So can I apply Newton's second law to that particle only? Yeah, why not? Okay, at that instant, uh, in a very small 
time frame, okay? You don't really have to worry about rotation aspect of it. It's just an acceleration vector pointing in a direction. Fine, A, T, I. You multiply it by the mass of the object. What do you get? M times A. You get the net force on that object. All right, so that is F I net. Not the external force, okay? I'm talking about the product, M I times A T I. By Newton's second law, that must be the force, the net force, okay? Because the, the force is from the neighboring Lego pieces. You can include them. If you add them up, it'll give you the vector sum of those forces, which we call the net force, okay? So because of that force, it is accelerating in that direction, okay? Now, in the case of rotation, though, on a different particle, uh, you will have a different acceleration because of the radius difference, all right? So that's Fi net. Now, these forces on individual Lego pieces, what if I calculate the torque? Now we have the concept of torque, right? What if I calculate the torque due to this force, this net force, Fi net, uh, about the pivot point, in this case, center of mass, okay? But this thinking applies to not only center of mass, it applies to any point, okay? The door, the hinge at the side, it's not the center of mass, all right? Um, so in our example, it's a center of mass. What about the torque due to this force, Fi net, with respect to a point, pivot point, P? What do you do? You find the uh, lever arm. But if you think about it, the net force has to be in the same direction as the uh, acceleration, tangential acceleration. So I'm gonna use red here. Red represents the net force on this object, Lego piece, ith Lego piece. It has to be, right? The direction, it's a vector equation. Both sides should agree in the direction. So Fi net is in the direction of the tangential acceleration, the tangent, which makes the angle between Fi net and the radius, by definition of a tangent, 90 degrees, okay? So this torque then will be simply, I'm just writing the magnitude now, Fi net, times Ri, okay? This will be the torque, this torque, let's call it Ti, not T, tau, tau. Tau means torque, okay? Tau I is equal to Fi net Ri. What is the direction of this torque? Now, uh, use the right hand rule again. It's a vector product for um, any vector product, A cross B. You, what you do is use your thumb, okay? Thumb is A, index is B, so A cross B. Middle finger shows you which direction the product is. A cross B gives you this direction, okay? Perpendicular to both A and B. So in this case, torque. Uh, I, okay, so the vector R, so torque is Ri cross Fi net. That's where we have the cross product. So this is Ri. Okay, so Ri cross F 
Just do it. When you watch this video, use your, take your right hand, not the left hand, but the right hand. Put your thumb in the direction of the uh, R. Okay, let me do it like this. Hang on. Oops. Okay, you see the screen here? Now put your thumb, thumb in the direction of R. And then index finger in the direction of force. Okay, like this. R cross F, which way the middle finger is pointing? It's pointing at you. All right? So that is the direction of torque. Okay. I hope it's zooming fine. All right, so do we need more light here? Okay, anyways, so the torque is coming towards you, coming out of the monitor, right? That's the direction of torque. Direction is, again, coming out of the page. coming out of the page, and the magnitude is Fi net times Ri. But we know what Fi net is. Okay, so that's equal to Mi times At I. This times Ri. And then we remember this from the uh, rotational and linear relationship. We take this, then plug it in here. So we get mi times ri times alpha times ri. All right? Or Mi, we have two Ri's, which makes Ri squared. That times alpha, all right? That's equal to tau I. The torque on the ith Lego piece, but this chunk is made of 1,000 Lego pieces, all right? And each Lego piece, has a different mass and each Lego piece is at a different radius from the rotation center. That's why we use the letter I. But what is common? That is the alpha and omega. Okay, the angular velocity, omega, and angular acceleration instantaneously they all share the same uh, alpha, all right? So if they share the same alpha, when we add these up, so add, add all of them. Okay, so one, two, all these Lego pieces, 1,000 of them, or any number, okay? In, I mean, if you don't want to work with Legos, think about all the molecules, atoms, all the protons, okay? Billions of them. Add them up. Add the, uh, the, the torque. Use a summation symbol from one to a large number. Large number, so mi ri squared, right? Alpha. Now alpha is the same for all mi, okay? It's not part of the summation. And the summation we already know as the moment of inertia. So this is I, moment of inertia. 
So the moment of inertia of the object times its angular acceleration at that instant, that product gives you the sum of the individual torques on each piece. All right. So we call that the external torque. All right. And as you saw, the torque is out of the page. So is alpha out of the page. They're in the same direction. So the external torque, if you want, call it the net torque on the object. Net torque on the object as a vector will be equal to the moment of inertia of the object times its angular acceleration. Okay, so this is nothing but Newton's second law for rotation. For rotation. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. In the next video, uh, I'm going to solve some problems and examples, and then um, consider um, rolling without slipping in particular, and what happens to the energy, because uh, you have a rotational motion and a translational motion. So what will be the total kinetic energy? And then, so we had the counterparts of uh, acceleration, you know, velocity for rotation, kinetic energy. We have rotational kinetic energy. Newton's second law. We have a rotational form of the second law. What about uh, momentum, right? We have a linear momentum. Does it also have a rotational counterpart? Yes, it does. It's called angular momentum. So I'm going to talk about that in the uh, coming videos. And we're going to finish this chapter, okay?